Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman, beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say that you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say that she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. All right, I'm not sure if you guys understood what was going on there, but that was when Abraham told his wife to act like his sister so then he would not die, right? And then Pharaoh took her and married her. So I wonder what happened to Abraham. I mean, last week we saw Abraham, we saw our man Abram live up to all the hype, live up to all the greatness, right? God tells him to leave, leave his country, leave his home, leave his close relationships, and if we remember, God didn't even give him the details of where he was supposed to go. We went through Genesis 12, 1 last week that said this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So what does Abraham do? What was his response? Well, again, if we look back to last week, verse 4 in Genesis 12, it says, So Abraham, or Abram, went as the Lord told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haram. Abraham just simply goes. He follows God's plain word. He trusts God. He obeys God. And again, we talked about the fact that Abram was a young 75, right? It was Abraham's time to just enjoy the retired life with his bride and live off his pension. And yet at 75, Abram's on mission for God. What a challenge. What an encouragement for us to see that we're never too old or too young to answer the call of God to be used by God, amen? But at the same time, And at this point, Abram looks like a superhero, right? He, he looks like a superhero in the faith. This, this is explained in Hebrews 11, 8, when it says, By faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. It was like God blindfolded Abram. And said, let's go. And Abraham, without hesitation, went with God. That's faith. That's living an act of faith. That's the sort of faith Christ says in the New Testament will move mountains. I wonder if we can relate to such dynamic and powerful faith. Do we ourselves have that sort of alive, acting faith in God? When the world rages 
against you because of Christ. When the world looks at you and laughs, when your friends and even your family members reject you, will you stand for Christ? But more than stand for Christ, will you live for Christ? Abraham seems so faithful. And then we get to verse 10, our verses this morning, where everything seems to unravel. Everything seems to fall apart. We went from Superman sort of faith last week to puny man faith, no faith this week. What happened? What went wrong with Abram? Well, let's open our Bibles to Genesis 12, verses 10 through 20. Genesis 12, verses 10 through 20. As we begin, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us your word to guide us, to lead us, but ultimately to, to know you more, to love you more. We thank you for Christ and what he has done for us. We thank you that we, we've come together as a corporate body of believers, as the family of God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. What a blessing it is to come together as family, to love Christ, to magnify Christ, Father, I ask that you use this message, use your spirit to, to work mightily in us. Transform us for your glory and honor alone. In Christ we pray, amen. Again, to recap from last week, Abram literally has been on a journey with God, right? And we, we, we said that he has been traveling over 800 miles with the Lord to Canaan. And he doesn't even know where he was headed. They finally arrive at Canaan, and God said this to Abram. Genesis 12, 7. I will give you this land, I will give you this land to your offspring. Now let's think about this for a moment. Abram has left everything that he has, and God says this. I'm giving this land to your children and their children one day. There was a little problem, though. Abram was getting up there. He's 75. Sarah, we assume she was about 65. And they don't have children. The question is, what offspring is God talking about? So God's future blessings are dependent on children that don't exist yet. And then we get to verse 10, where finally things to begin to look up. The sun finally comes out of the clouds. God finally blesses Abram. God says this, I'm going to give you your best life now, Abram. And then he says this, for now on, Abram, every day will be like Friday for you. When you believe it, you'll receive it. Obedience always equals physical blessings, doesn't it? I see some of you shaking your heads no, thinking I'm preaching false heresy from the pulpit, right? Genesis 12, 10 says this, now there was a famine in the land. Wait a minute here. Where's the blessings? God takes them into a famine. After everything Abram has given up, he doesn't get anything. He doesn't even get a latte from Starbucks. Nothing. The question is why? Why would God lead Abram to a place where there's a famine? Well, let's compare this to a parent-child relationship just for a minute here. Why would a parent allow their children to go through some sort of adversity? Why do we as parents allow our children to go through times of struggles? 
And the answer is love. We care for our children. We want what's best for them. And in the end, struggles often help them grow, amen? Help them learn to persevere, to mature. And similarly, God wants what's best for Abram. God cares deeply for Abram, and he loves him perfectly. So he's helping Abram grow. So God begins to test his faith, his young faith. I mean, Abram's faith is going to have to grow exponentially for what he's about to face in the future. I wonder when we face trials, when we face struggles, when we face hard circumstances, if we look at them as opportunities to grow. Genesis, or James 2, 2 through 4 says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So James here says, when trials come our way, he says, count it all joy. James isn't saying that you'll be excited or that you'll feel good about them. That's not what he's saying. It's not that I'm so happy, praise God, that my car just broke down and I'm going to be late to my appointment. Or praise God that I was rejected by my friends for my faith. Or praise God that I just lost my job and I can't pay my bills. Or praise God that my loved one just passed away and I'm so sad. It's not that. No, it's not a feeling. It's not a giddy emotion but it's recognizing that the trial has been passed through the loving and graceful hands of our Father. He's allowed it for our good. That's what it's saying. That's why it says, count it all joy. Or I think the NIV says, consider it pure joy. It's a mindset. It's the way we think about the trial, not how we feel about them. Let me say that again. It's the way we think about the trial, not how we feel about them. But this leads to point number one. We recognize that trials make us rich in faith. Brothers and sisters, friends, we recognize that trials make us rich in faith. I wonder if we can see through the pain of our suffering. If we can see through the stress of our troubles. If we can see through the annoyance of our struggles that God is at work in us and through us, amen? James says that the trials that we face are testing our faith. It's building our faith. It's perfecting our faith. It's completing our faith. That's what God's doing with Abram. Abram is going to need a lot of faith for the future. So let's see what happens as Abram is tested by God. Let's go back to Genesis 12, 10. Genesis 12, 10 says this. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. We don't know for sure, but it looks like Abram is reacting instead of trusting. There's no mention of God here. There's no inquiring of God. It just says that Abram goes to Egypt because of the famine. This looks very different than when we saw Abram again a week ago. Let's look back a few verses to Genesis 12, 7, 9, and and see the difference. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, 
To your offspring I will give this land you. So Abram built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Verse 8, from there he moved to the hill country on east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on still going toward Negev. So we notice in last week's verses the communication Abram has with God, the closeness. Notice that twice Abram builds an altar to worship God, right? And he he builds the altar the second time in verse 8 to specifically call out to the Lord. Abram is living life depending on God. But here then we go to verse 10, something seems to change. It seems Abram stops walking in faith as Abram sees a famine where God led him in Canaan, right? So he decides, I'm going to go to Egypt where there's food. He turns from faith in God to faith in himself. It seems so innocent. It seems so normal to make a wise decision. But I must say, it's never wise, friends. It's never wise, brothers and sisters, if we first don't inquire, if we first don't seek God's face in our situations. Which leads to point number two. Point number two says we naturally depend on ourselves. Point number two says that we naturally depend depend on ourselves. You might be thinking, well, how do you know that I naturally depend on myself? Well, I'm not a prophet, but I have God's word, and God's word tells me this is what we naturally do. For example, Proverbs 21.2 says this, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. So we see here that naturally, I'm deceived into thinking that my ways are always right, they're always correct. That's what the verse is saying. I mean, this is obvious, especially if you're married. Amen? I mean, who's usually right in an argument? Let's take a quick poll here. Let's, let's, let's wake up a little bit here. Let's take a quick poll. Wives, I'm going to start with you, okay? I'm going to start with you. Let's see a show of hands if you usually are right when you're arguing with your husband. Let's see a show of hands. I think, now you can't be telling lies at church. That's a bad idea. I got like three people, so usually when you're arguing, you think you're wrong? Wow, okay. Okay, husbands, let's see if you're a little more honest and vulnerable. Let's see a show of hands if you're usually right in an argument. I am. I mean, I I think I am even now when I'm preaching this. I mean, if we thought we were wrong, we wouldn't be arguing in the first place, correct? Amen? Okay, there we go. Amen. The point is this. If we think If I think my ways are naturally right, then often I trust in my own judgments, in my own estimation, instead of taking them to the Lord. That's easy for us to fall into. It's comparable to when Joby, our four-year-old, thinks he knows better than mommy and daddy. It's just an opportunity to get some parenting in during this sermon. <laughs> we know better, bud. Proverbs 3, 3, 5 through 7 says this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your Pass straight, right? Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. What we see is that our faith in ourselves competes with our faith in God. That's what it's saying here. We can't trust in God and trust in ourselves at the same time. 
This is why trusting in ourselves is so dangerous. It's, it's worshiping an idol. Instead of worshiping Christ, we're in essence worshiping ourselves. And you may be thinking, well, how do I know? If I'm trusting in myself over God, it's a good question, right? The first answer, the, the simple answer is prayer. What does our prayer life look like? Prayer reveals our dependence on God. It's simple, right? Prayer reveals our dependence on God. A Christ-exalting life is a prayerful life. Let me say that again. A Christ-exalting life is a prayerful life. A prayerful life is a faithful life, while a prayerless life is a faithless life. I mentioned in a prior sermon that Luke, our oldest, when he was around, I think, five, said to me during one of our evening devotionals, he said, Daddy, prayer is when we're talking to God. And when we read his word, it's when God is talking to us. And I said, that's so good. I mean, that's so clear. I'll have to use that in a sermon, Luke. Now I've used it twice. Prayer is when we're talking to God. It shows our relationship with God. Prayer reveals our dependence on God, my friends. I wonder, how much are we talking to God through prayer? How often are we going to God to praise him, to worship him in prayer? How often are we getting on our knees to thank him for all the blessings that we often take for granted in prayer? How often are we going to God to confess our many sins, to ask God for forgiveness for our selfishness, for our pride, for our lack of faith, for our anger, for our lust, for our daily struggles with sin? In prayer, how often are we praying for those inside the church, our brothers and sisters who are, who are sick physically or struggling spiritually? How often are we praying for them? How often are we praying for those outside the church, like family and friends or neighbors who, who don't know Christ? going off the cliff. We see in our verses that Abram stopped talking to God. He didn't inquire or call out to him. He depended on himself. So let's see where this self-reliant attitude led him. Genesis 12, 10 through 13. Let's read it. Genesis 12, 10 through 13. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Verse 11, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Verse 13, say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life will be spared for your sake. So they head towards Egypt, and Abram's wife is beautiful. I mean, she's just not beautiful to him, but apparently to everyone else as well, right? And Abram knows that the Egyptians are going to want to marry Sarah, and he assumes that they will kill him. 
So Abram comes up with a plan without turning to God for help once again. And this plan, I would suggest, sort of reminds me of one of those supposed good ideas that you think about in your head. And it seems so perfect, right? But then you say it out loud. And you, you share it with others, and then you recognize your good idea was an utter train wreck, right? Have you ever been there? Well, Abram doesn't seem to see that his plan is an utter train wreck. Verse 13 again says this, Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. So Abram concludes by saying to Sarah, Hun, this is all for you. Because when my life is spared, that will benefit you so much. So Abram is just trying to do what's best for his wife, amen? Has nothing to do with him at all. He's such a good husband. I mean, yes, it might save his life. That's a minor detail. But that's minor compared to poor Sarah, who will lose such a valiant husband. Okay, obviously, I'm being a little facetious here, right? But Abram seems to be spinning things a little bit here to his wife. It sort of reminds me of Bill O'Reilly, who used to say the spin stops here, right? Well, let's say for Abram, the spin stops here. We're going to call that out. But what's going on? How can he consider putting his wife in such a terrible situation, in such a terrible predicament? Well, we establish that Abram's not turning to the Lord. He's depending on himself, and he's facing trouble that only the Lord can handle, number one, right? And this leads to point number three. The sin of self-reliance is the catalyst for breeding more sin. Let me say that again, sort of a mouthful. The sin of self-reliance is the catalyst for breeding more sin. A self-reliant life is a sin-filled life because the focus isn't on God any longer but on self. Let's sort of look at what just occurred. Abram isn't walking in faith, which means he's automatically sinning, correct? He's sinning. He's planning on lying, that's sin. He now has his wife lying too, which is more sin. I want you guys to, you can, you can say something. He, he says it's for her benefit, which is deceiving his wife. Again, that's sin, plus he's probably deceiving himself, which is sin, as he's trying to ease his own conscience, as he selfishly protects himself over his wife, which is, you got it, sin. So we might start seeing a pattern, and it becomes evident. It becomes clear that one decision after the next is tainted with sin. Sin. But the question is, what sin is driving Abraham? What heart issue is blossoming in Abram's self-reliant attitude? And I'm bringing this out just quickly because this problem really doesn't even seem like a problem to most in the church. This problem is more of an inconspicuous issue, a, a more unnoticed heart issue. It sort of flies under the radar for most people. And it's this issue, fear. But it's, it isn't just a general fear. That's not what I'm talking about here. It's a more specific, focused fear. It's the fear of man. It's the fear of man. Verse 13 again, listen. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, that my life may be spared for your sake. Who is Abram thinking about? Amen, right? Who is he worried about? 
himself. Abram's fearful of being killed by the Egyptians. Now remember this as well. God has just told him that he's going to be blessed beyond measure. And now he's turned 180 degrees in another direction as he's gripped. He's blinded by fear. But again, fear wasn't the root problem, right? We're trying to be good counselors here. It, wasn't, it didn't start out with the fear of man. It's the fruit of Abram's self-reliance, his pride. If Abram would have continued to walk with God, he would have been walking in faith instead of walking in the fear of man. Do we see that? It may be a little shocking to hear this, but we can be just like Abram. We can be just like Abram. The trials come, the troubles come, the storms of life come, and we can try to take on the problems ourselves. I don't mean to pick on Joby, but I have another Joby story, my four-year-old. He often says, I can do it myself, Daddy. That's where we're at with him. And right now he's sort of desperate to be able to unlock our front door. So when we're coming home from an outing, every time he runs to the front door first before anyone else, and he gets on his tiptoes, and he wrestles with the lock. He even makes little grunting noises. I'm like, what is he doing? And then he finally, when he's exhausted, he allows my wife or I to get the door. He steps out of the way, and with ease, we unlock the door. No struggle. No grunting. Although it would be a little humorous if my, grunt, my wife was grunting like that. But my point is, we often try to handle situations and struggles on our own instead of turning to Christ, like my little son, Joby. We give in to sin, and instead of repenting and turning to Christ, we say things like this, I'm just going to try harder. Or, I'm never doing that again. I'm done with that. But friends, we need more than our own self-will to battle the, the world, flesh, and Satan. We're no match for the spiritual powers in this world. We're no match for them. We need Christ. We need the power of the Holy Spirit working mightily through us as we depend on Christ. Amen? Or, we're in a trial. And we stress and fret. We're in a struggle. We stress and fret. And we stress and fret. We, we set stress and fret. We stress and fret. We, we stress and fret. This is getting a little awkward. But we're, we stress and fret, right? But finally we get to the point that we can't stress and fret any longer. So out of desperation, we turn to God in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says this. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, brothers and sisters, we don't need to be self-reliant, but God-reliant, God-dependent. Amen? Our natural reaction should be to look up. Depend on him instead of depend on him instead of look within. We need to live our lives on our knees. Live a life of prayer. This is how we run into the loving arms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's through prayer. So we probably should move on here. So what happens? when Abram and Sarah go to Egypt. What happens? Let's look at verse, let's look at verse 14 in Genesis 12. 
Genesis 12, 14 says this. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of the Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken in the Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servant, servants, female donkeys, and camels. Now, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface on this because I can't really do justice for this, all this text that we're going through. But what we can see here is the consequences of sin. The consequences of Abram's sin. We see that Sarah is now given over to Pharaoh as one of his wives. I mean, can you imagine the fear? The vulnerability she's, she's feeling as she's sitting in his, 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 his palace? Can we imagine? And then on the other hand, you have Abram who's just lost his wife, his, his joy, his love. He has to live with the fact that he schemed up this whole plan to save his own neck. And similarly, it's no different from us. We will face the music for our sinful actions as well. Sin is dangerous, brothers and sisters. Sin always has a price, which leads to point number four. Our sin is a monster ready to destroy us. Our sin is a monster ready to destroy us. Whether it's the man who looks at pornography and becomes increasingly self-centered as he destroys his own marriage, or it's the teenager who doesn't listen to his parents and he ends up making terrible decisions that affects the rest of his life, or it's the addict who is destroying his family with his addictions, we see that sin affects us, those around us as well. But more than that, brothers and sisters, it hurts our relationship with Christ. I wonder this morning, what is our view of our sinful struggles? I wonder if we know what our sinful struggles are today. Do we recognize the gravity of our own depravity? I mean, think about it. Our sin was so great. It was so serious, so devastating that God himself had to come to earth and suffer and die to save us from our sin. This is the good news, amen? This is the gospel that Christ died for us even while we were still living in rebellion against him. Romans 5, 8. So the question is, what will God do to Abram when he sins so wickedly? Will God punish him for his sin? Will God discipline for his rebellion? Well, let's look back to our passages to find out. Genesis 12, starting in 17, our last section here. But the, the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you tell me that she, was your, that she wasn't your wife? Why did you say she, was, she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go, verse 20. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So God doesn't discipline Abram, nor does he even reprimand him here, right? No, God miraculously saves Abram and Sarah from this terrible situation that Abraham created, which leads to point number five. God is always the hero for our good. Let me say that again. God, my friends, is always the hero for our good. I don't want to compare God to Superman, although, 
By saying Superman, I just got all the children's attention in the congregation. But he's far greater than Superman. And yes, for those of us who like Batman and Spider-Man better, God is greater than them as well. Because God knows us individually. He knows us better than we know ourselves, friends, brothers and sisters. So God coming in and saving the day for Abram wasn't a random reaction on God's part, but it was a part of God's overall plan to help Abraham become the great man of faith that he became. It was exactly what Abram needed. It was a reminder for Abram to wait, to depend, to worship the Lord. It brought back Abram to a high view of God. It, it brought back Abram to a holy awe of God. I wonder as you think about Abram, I wonder if you've experienced this mercy this grace, this perfect help from God in your storms. I mean, God has been so gracious to us. He so many times has worked in ways in my life that I couldn't have dreamed or imagined. And I must admit to you right now that I've made some terrible decisions in my life and still do at times. And God has saved me often from myself. And because he has, it causes me to just fall on my knees and praise to him. Worship him. Thank him. Honor him. Glorify him. What else can I do? Romans 2.4, it was a verse that Casey mentioned, I think, probably four weeks ago says that God's kindness leads us to repentance. God's kindness leads us to repentance. I wonder if the kindness and mercy of God is leading you to repentance this morning. Is his patience with you, his grace with you, his continued love for you, leading you to turn from your sin and worship him alone as the only Lord and Savior? There may be some of us this morning who don't know this love, this grace, this mercy from God. Friend, it starts with Christ. It starts with Christ. John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. God gave what was most precious to him to save us. I wonder if you've turned the only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've repented and believed on Christ and Christ alone. God is so merciful to us. He's so gracious to us. He's the epitome of love. He doesn't just give love, but he himself is love. I would beg you this morning to turn to God. Turn to the Christ who's love, to this Lord and Savior of love. He's calling you this morning. He's drawing you to himself. Let today be the day of salvation. Turn from depending on your, yourself, which is natural, the self-reliance way we naturally are, and follow after the heart of God. And if you need some help in understanding how to follow Christ, how to walk in the gospel and learn how to, to truly worship Christ as Lord and Savior, please come talk to myself or Casey or any of the other elders or any of our members that would love to sit and talk to you about the gospel of Christ. Well, I hope we can see ourselves in Abram this morning. 
We can see the flaws, the sin, the clear abandonment of God to live for, our own, for ourselves often in our lives. But more than seeing that, what I want you to really see this morning is that I hope you see a God who's glorious, a Savior who is gracious, a Lord who is patient, Christ who is there when our life is falling apart, a God who is working for his glory and our good. Let's go to him in prayer. Holy Father, how good you are to us. How often, like Abram, we walk in our own self-reliance and self-confidence. Father, help continue to test our faith. Help us to not be self-reliant, but God-reliant, God-dependent. Destroy any of our own self-confidence and help us to truly depend on Christ and Christ alone. Help us to have the faith that Abraham had as you tested him and, and grew him. Father, help us to see a gracious and loving God who doesn't just save us reactively, but you're actively working every moment in our lives because you know what we need and because you deeply love us as your children. Oh, Father, thank you for Christ. Thank you for your word. In him we pray. Amen.